Hi, welcome to the QNX Virtual Campus Lecture Series. Uh, this is part two of a two-part video on our adaptive partitioning scheduler, and once again, Attila is back. By now you should know why the scheduler was needed. In this video, we're going to cover how it works so well. Here's Attila. Today on Cool Stuff from QNX, we're going to show you how to boot the QNX microkernel into a robot. Hey, 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 no. What, what? Adaptive partitioning? Adaptive partitioning. Oh, jeez, we're not going to get on YouTube with adaptive partitioning. Uh, I'm Atul Danko from Kinex Software Systems, and uh, this is uh, part two of adaptive partitioning scheduling. In uh, part one, we told stories as to why we did adaptive partitioning, and in part two, we're going to explain basically how it works. So on slide 11, the first problem with doing any kind of a fair share schedule is trying to figure out what percentage CPU means. In a single processor, there's only one thread executed at even time, so for that microsecond, it's using 100% of the CPU. So a percentage CPU usage of a thread can only be can only make sense if you define it over some kind of a some kind of an averaging window. So on, on slide one, uh, slide eleven, there's a little animation. If you click it, it shows a bunch of vertical rectangles on a sliding window that shows <coughs> that the adaptive partitioning scheduler keeps a history of usage of uh, CPU time of threads over some period of time. Every time a clock interrupt happens, it rolls the sliding window forward. So at any given time, it maintains a history of normally the last 100 milliseconds of usage. This sliding window mechanism is basically what allows us to give a good definition, or well-defined if you're a math weenie, to the phrase uh, percentage CPU usage and percentage budget. The key in implementing the sliding window with this is the observation that simply counting tick interrupts doesn't work. Tick interrupt counting is usually the way most of our operating systems attempt to account for CPU time. <clears throat> but in practice, um, scheduling occurs much more rapidly in clock interrupts, especially on Kinex where we encourage loss of me message passing. It's quite common to get 50 scheduling operations in a single clock interrupt interval. So counting clock ticks basically doesn't work. Instead what we do in adaptive partitioning is a mechanism we call microbilling. We use a hardware support to get a micro counter with nanosecond resolution, which is why we can make adaptive partitioning work. <clears throat> so on slide 12, uh, we talk about a uh, question of how do you define the contents of a partition? And uh, in the previous um, video, I mentioned that we were going to define partition as a set of threads working for a common purpose. Now, by that we meant was two inheritance trees. One was threads that were created by another process would be in the same partition as the parent process. And on messaging, we would do something clever with what we call partition inheritance. But the general message is a partition is lock not locked to a static set of code. <coughs> and OS services don't necessarily have their own separate partition or like an A-Ring 6 where they're effectively unpartitioned, uncontrolled, we will put the OS services in whatever partition they need to be for the current transaction they're handling for the current client. So let me show you how that works on slide 13. So the next couple of slides, I've got some um, colored boxes here representing partitions and uh, <clears throat> some threads in various colors. Green means that the thread is executing, red means the thread is blocked. And yellow means the thread would like to execute, it's ready to run, but it's not executing because something else is. <clears throat> and in this particular example, if you click the animation, you'll see that the thread in partition one is running, and it sends a message to the file system process, which is not in any partition right now. And as it does that, the file system or, uh, server thread is temporarily promoted into the partition of, of, um, of partition one in thread nine. <clears throat> Um, should some other thread, say in partition 2, also send a message to the same file system process, see that priority 10 thread on the right, it sends a message to a different thread in the file system process, and that different thread now becomes a temporary member of partition 2. So what you see in this case is two threads of one process are actually running in two separate partitions. This is normal, this is in fact good, because what it means is the CPU time spent by the file system process is automatically built to the client's partitions which means that when you come to engineer a system, you don't necessarily have to sit down and do a lot of calculations to figure out how much CPU time you should budget for utilities like file systems. The time will automatically be accounted for by the client's partitions. In slide 14, <coughs> we're going to explain in case of what happens in adaptive partitioning when you're under normal load. Now, under normal load, we've got two partitions and they both have available budget. So with respect to the, to the previous slide with the sliding window, what we mean is for each of these partitions within the last 100 millisecond averaging window, the calculation shows that they were both using less than their maximum budget. In this case, the highest priority thread is priority 9, 
and it's the one that's running. Should uh, another thread in uh, partition 2 become a re uh, ready to run, the priority 10 thread on the right, it goes green and it runs. We simply switch partitions as rapidly as possible when, when the priorities change, provided they both have budgets. The short answer here is that <clears throat> when partitions have budget, it behaves exactly like normal QNX scheduling, which is priority parameter scheduling, and this produces predictable response times. When a partition runs out of budget, what we call overload, then the interesting thing happens. Here the situation is, on the right in partition 2, partition 2 has no budget remaining, and it has the highest priority ready to run thread, that yellow thread label 10. However, it's not the one that's running. The one that's running is in partition 1, and it's only priority 9. Why is it running? Well, it's got the highest priority of all the partitions that has budget. This is the mode that the uh, adaptive partitioning scheduling runs into when it forces <coughs> uh, partitions to be limited to their budget guarantees. On slide 16, we have an uh, um, automatic animation here of what happens when you have unused CPU. In a situation like that, you have to have, say, um, at least one partition where all the threads in that partition are all blocked, they're all sleeping, they're actually using their budget. So it means there's extra CPU time available in the system. What the adaptive partitioning scutter does is it hands out that free time to other partitions that are demanding it. And what this animation shows is that that uh, free CPU time will be handed out to whatever the highest priority thread is in any one of those other partitions. The trick being is those other partitions are allowed to run over their budgets as they're using up the free time. Um, should partition 3 decide that it now wants to run, um, it will then immediately have budget and begin running and partitions 1 and 2 will stop. <clears throat> this all works fine except for the observation that when you are in overload mode, um, you're effectively running a batch scheduler instead of a real-time scheduler because what it means is there are circumstances where you will not be running the highest priority threat. <clears throat> so to create a balance between a fair share schedule and real-time scheduler, we create a concept called critical threads. Critical threads are threads that uh, a system designer selects. Hopefully there is a minority of them, and they're generally used for things like interrupt handling. And as slide 17 shows, <clears throat> is <clears throat> if we have uh, one partition without budget, partition two on the right, and it's got a high priority critical thread, we will run it anyway, even though its partition is out of budget. In other words, a critical thread has something like a uh, get, get out of jail free card, meaning that it is allowed to break the rules for some period of time. We think this is the necessary additional part of the design that distinguishes adaptive partitioning from all those other fair share schedulers out there, which are effectively not real time, because in general when you're doing fair share scheduling, there's a point in time where you do not run the highest priority thread. With adaptive partitioning using critical threads, you can still get the real-time behavior that you absolutely need if you're willing to break the rules. Although actually, we probably picked the wrong name for critical threads. We, you know, following along with the metaphor of budget, we probably should have called it overdraft protection because it behaves exactly that way. You can run your checking account into the red for a certain period of time, but if you do it for too long, the bank closes your account. That's exactly what happens with critical threads. There's a second budget called the critical budget. If you go into critical time more than critical budget, it's considered to be an application error in the operating system. Um, basically cancels your uh, critical budget entirely and uh, delivers notification events. It's considered to be an application programming error. But it does give you the ability to execute in real-time mode, even with the fair share scheduler. There's one last uh, scenario that's of interest. Is we discovered to our chagrin that a great number of our customers kind of didn't understand how to use priorities and would create a thousand thread system and make everything priority 10. And what that meant for something like adaptive partitioning is there are a lot of circumstances where several partitions all looked equivalent in terms of their ability to run. And so we decided we had to come up with a version of the definition of the partition which did something sensible when priorities were equal, highest priorities and several partitions were equal. So I actually uh, tested the design of a number of possible algorithms to distinguish between uh, partitions. I tried round rubber, I tried to uh, favorite the partition with the most free time or the one that's waiting the longest. And I found that all of these had very bad latency behaviors. Uh, in particular, I found that a lot of algorithms, if you had, say, two partitions, each with 50% budgets, they would tend to run five ticks and then five ticks and then five ticks and then five ticks, um, which doesn't really produce good latency behavior. So I came up with a specific algorithm that in the, in the case of partitions otherwise undistinguished and equal priorities, it would interleave them like this. Would leave, it'll leave them automatically by the budget share in order to minimize the, um, the 
interior partition latency whenever possible.